good place now. You are listening to Perspectives with Ashley Burgess. Welcome back live to Live Your True Life Perspectives, and I'm your host, Ashley Burgess. You know, aging is a part of life, and all of us are going to age. I guess it depends on how graceful we age. And I think that more often than not in the media, we get talked about, well, aging as far as the way your skin looks, or how many wrinkles you have, or the way your muscle mass looks, or the list goes on. But a lot of times when we're talking about anti-aging, we're not talking about what matters most. And I know that my listeners, and I know myself, I know you care about your mental health, your mental well-being, your physicality, how you feel, also how you look. But the mental capacity and the cognitive ability is extremely important. And I think it's important for everybody. And sometimes when we get older, we might forget something or we start getting a little scared because, you know, we had an idea in our head and it seems to poof right out. So how do we deal with that? And how do we get the information that we need to live vibrantly, right? Because it's, it's not about, you know, just living. It's about living vibrantly, about living vibrantly at any age. And we can do a lot of things about that to create that reality, okay? And so what I figured is that we should probably bring in an expert that understands this. And join me here on Live Your True Life Perspectives, L.J. Rowan. L.J. is a certified gerontologist. She's a blogger. She's a speaker. And she's covered the latest scientific research relating to aging and aging in place and and the study of the aging process. L.J., great to have you here live on Live Your True Life Perspectives. How are you doing today? I am wonderful, Ashley, and thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk to your listeners and to visit with you about vibrant aging. So it's interesting because when we first met, um, it was interesting listening to you talk about, you know, the aging process and the study of it. And I think that's what's so neat is that doing what you do, you're able to actually look at the process of aging, look at particular problems that older folks have, and kind of understand how to pinpoint it, but how to find really where the problem began. Yes, absolutely. I think that gerontologists as a whole, we look at uh, two things, retention and prevention. At least I do. And some of the gerontologists that I stay in contact with also do that because that's the most important thing is retaining what we have and preventing decline. Maintaining what we have is so important and obviously making sure that there is no decline. What is one thing that you see with a lot of your clients and patients when you're dealing with them? So let's talk about brain fog. I'm sure that you run into that when you're working with your patients. And I think a lot of us get fearful because we forget something. And as we age, it might get harder and harder to deal with some of that memory issue. And I think that fear of having dementia or having Alzheimer's is something that is a fear factor for all of us, but as we age as well. Ashley, you you are very much right in that. And because I focus on women 55 and over, so they are postmenopausal women, they do experience brain fog. And so let's talk a little bit about what brain fog is. Brain fog is a combination of things, but at the root of it, it is usually because we are no longer producing estrogen. Women after menopause don't produce a lot of estrogen, very little as a matter of fact, as many of us know, that have reached that point. And as a result, the estrogen feeds our brain. When we are young and we're firing on all cylinders and we have what I call a protective armor of hormones, we have a lot of estrogen pumping through our bodies. And so our brains work very fast and are very clear. And brain fog is related to what I would say is memory dysfunction or memory loss or just unable to recall what you want to remember. And so after menopause, women experience this a lot, but there's some really key things that we can do once we are over menopause and 55 and up that can really help us keep our memory strong and dispel brain fog to a great degree. And often brain fog is is, um, 
the most important time that we have brain fog is during menopause when we're having that big flux of hormones and things are starting to shut down. We don't have it usually when we're younger and we can all, and don't have it as much when we get older, but we have it right there in that window of three to five years. However, some women that do experience brain fog way after menopause. And so there's a whole list of things that we can do that can help to uh, alleviate brain fog as we get older. So you study this. So let me ask you a question. Okay, so if we're dealing with, you know, someone that's listening to the show right now and they said, you know, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm 55 plus, you know, I've been experiencing that. Is one of the first things you recommend uh, your clients going and getting their hormone levels checked? Is that the first thing or are there other things that you like to segue to first? Well, the thing about the hormone, getting your hormones checked is the every woman will be at about the same place. Some women produce more estrogen after menopause than others. But as a general rule, you do really don't need to go have a hormone panel done if you're experiencing brain fog and you're over 55 and you're postmenopausal because that's sort of the way it works. And it will dissipate some, but there's things you can do. Let's talk about the number one thing that I like to think of as almost the magic bullet to save our lives and make and keep us vibrant until the day we fly off with the angels, and that is exercise. Exercise does so many things for our brains and our bodies and our spirits, but most importantly for brain fog, what it does is it puts oxygen into our brain. It causes new neurons to be formed. It causes our telomeres to lengthen. It does so many things that is the opposite of brain fog. It puts back online our memory. It puts back online our recall. And so exercise is my first line of defense. The second thing is sugar. Sugar drives inflammation. Inflammation is the cause of all disease. It is the cause of all illness that is beyond a shadow of a doubt now known by all the scientific community and doctors alike. So the number one red hot this minute thing to do is to lower our inflammation. In addition to exercise doing that, we need to clean up our diets. And sugar is the number one driver of inflammation. And that's sugar in the white powdered form. It is sugar in the hidden forms like things that, like fructose and words that don't really seem like sugar, but they really are sugar. And the last one is alcohol. Uh, distilled alcohol and wine both have sugar in them. And limiting as much sugar as we can and getting a clean as diet as possible that is, also doesn't have processed foods will do a great deal towards moving our brain into functioning and firing on all cylinders. Let me ask you a question. So let's say like you you have a, a client that's come to you, you know, in, in that age range, having the brain fog. Have you seen that if people reverse some of the things that they're doing? So let's say like you're dealing with a client that drinks several glasses of wine a night. Let's say it's, uh, you know, high sugary wine, has a tendency of eating sweets. If they make some of those changes, even at 55, 56, 57, have you seen basically the ship turn around a little bit and, and, and they get better and be able to eliminate that brain fog? Not a little bit, completely. Oh. And for most women, if they will cut out the sugar, they will start to exercise one hour a day, which does, as I said, so many things. It's not just for brain fog. It's also for our, for our hearts and our organs and so many other things that exercise really is the ma almost the magic bullet. And an hour a day is what one of the top cardiologists in the world, who is a woman, Dr. Chikwi, recommends. And that will keep our heart healthy. So keeping our heart healthy, keeping it pumping the blood, pumps it to our brain, which gives us the nutrients we need for our brain to function on all cylinders. So I have seen great improvement, drastic improvement, unbelievable improvement from exercising and cutting out sugar. And the last one I want to add in there is sleep. We are a sleep deprived nation. There's books now out about sleep and what, how important it is, seven to eight hours of good quality sleep will also really dissipate that brain fog. Sugar, cutting out, cutting out sugar, exercise, and getting good quality sleep. 
Sleep is extremely important. It's good, though, because I think a lot of us, you know, you fear because many of us have those things that we need to change. And I'm one of those kind of people. I get a tendency. It's not all the time, but I'll go over to Whole Foods. It's right down from the office, and I'll get, like, a chocolate bar, you know. And I'm like, well, it's from Whole Foods, so, it's you know, it's a little better. And I, and I come up with that reasoning, you know. It's, it's kind of like the person that smokes a chain smokes a pack of cigarettes a day, but at the same point, they're eating vegan. You know, you, it, something's got to add up. But I feel like a lot of times when we get to a certain age, we get scared that there's no way of turning the ship around, that we've we've done these things, we've created this problem, and now we've kind of made our bed and we have to lie in it. So you're giving us hope that if we make these changes... Now, how long does it normally take, though, to make these changes to see a shift? 21 days is what the science tells us it takes to break an addiction. Sugar is an addiction, just like alcohol, just like smoking, just like uh, drugs, any or even shopping. All those are addictions. It takes our body, our physical body, and our psyche 21 days. And as a life coach, you have seen this happen with your clients, I am sure, over and over again. And that window of 21 days seems to be sort of that magic number that after 21 days, at least in the case of sugar, your body no longer craves sugar. And when it doesn't crave sugar, you don't, you're, you're not drawn to it. And I did an experiment in, in 2017 from Thanksgiving Day until Christmas Day. I gave up all sugar. And I thought, well, I can do this. It's only one holiday season, so I don't get to have my favorite Christmas cookies. Um, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. And it was fine. And I did it at the hardest time of the year to see if I could actually do it because I wasn't going to ask my clients to give up sugar if I had not tried it. I walked the walk and I talked the talk of what I asked them to do. So I did it at the hardest time of the year saying, okay, if I can do it between Thanksgiving and Christmas, chances are it'll be easier for you to do it in July. So I did it. And I will tell you this, Ashley, it's the most extraordinary thing because I wanted to do it in the field. I really wanted to experience it, and I did. And I have never gone back to having the craving for sugar, even the craving for wine that I had before I did the month off of the sugar. It was the most um, enlightening thing. And so now I can speak to my clients and, and to your listeners and to everybody to say, yes, this actually really works. Give it 21 days and you will not feel the draw to put sugar in your mouth every five minutes. This is awesome. When we return, we'll be talking more about that, more about maybe how she went through it and the feelings that she had going through giving up sugar, because I know many of you are scared. Hey, you know, like, where, what are we going to do here? What's behind door number two? But we're going to get the real information so you know how you can do it. And there are success stories and you can turn it around. So if you're feeling this way, feeling some brain fog, getting a little scared, a little fearful, don't worry. Hang on. We got some solutions. So stay tuned because Live Your True Life Perspectives with your host, me, Ashley Burgess, will be back in. We'll be back this time. You know it. We'll be back this time in two shakes. Turn it up and jump in the deep end on Perspectives. Now, here's Ashley. Welcome back live to Live Your True Life Perspectives, and I'm your host, Ashley Burgess. On today's show, we're talking about, well, brain health. We're talking about brain fog. We're talking about getting rid of the things that are holding us back. And I have an expert here on the show, LJ Rowan. LJ, it's been great having you on because you 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 know exactly what's going on. you got your finger on the pulse when it comes to this. We were talking about right before break about giving up sugar, and you gave up sugar at the hardest point you gave up sugar between Thanksgiving and Christmas, and I know everybody's like, okay, we're so far from there, but come on, everybody knows what it's like Thanksgiving and Christmas. You got the cookies, the candies, the cakes, the chocolate, the the sweet drinks, all that stuff going on. It's very hard to say no to. So when you took this time and you said, hey, I'm going to go 21 days, tell me how it was in the first few days of doing that. It was not as hard as I thought it would be in some regards, and that was I did what all the experts recommend. I cleared the house of sugary foods, and here is what I think is the best antidote for those first few days. So there's something called the glycemic index, 
which is an index of the amount of sugar in foods. And it's both in natural, in, in, in whole foods, which is a natural state, which is fruit and vegetables, as well as processed food. It goes from zero to 100. 100 is a slice of white bread. And zero is something that has no sugar in it, like broccoli. So the idea behind the glycemic index is that anything 50 or below on the glycemic index will not raise your insulin level, which does not kick in that sugar craving. Anything over 50 starts to kick in and feed that sugar craving because it's more sugar than it is other things. So what I did was I took the glycemic index and I looked at it and I saw every single thing that I could eat that was 50 or below and not everything at 50 because that's really on the line. I'm talking about things that are 12 or 22 and or 13 or 30. And I looked at that and in on that list, Ashley, I will tell you there is a ton of fabulous fruit and I love fruit, but I was able to zero in on the low glycemic fruit. So what I did was if I wanted something sweet, sugary, some kind of needed something, or even if I needed a, a, a glucose boost, like in the afternoon before I went to work out, I would have a low glycemic snack of some sort. And most often if it was, if I wanted sugar, say versus salty, I would go with berries which are low glycemic, but they are also packed with antioxidants and fiber, and they taste delicious, and they're so fresh, or a tangerine, which is also low, or an orange, or a grapefruit. And so I satisfied the desire for sugar by eating low glycemic fruit. And I also got all the multi-other benefits from it with all the minerals, the vitamins, the antioxidants, and the fiber. So that's how I did it, and pretty soon... That craving was, was lessened and that fire was extinguished because I was feeding my body something delicious that also gave me the glucose that I needed, but in a healthy way and in a way that didn't raise my insulin, that didn't drive inflammation, which is the cause of brain fog. And I, and I think that this is really helpful because if you can look at that, you can look at the glycemic index, you can pull it up on the internet if you want, you can find that out. It's very interesting. I love the fact that, yes, you can eat certain fruits, you know, cherries, um, certain things that you can't eat. Berries are really good. Um, but, you know, it's interesting. I find that a lot of times we have that – we, we kind of get misinformed. And I think you know what I'm talking about, LJ. Like people will go to, like, let's say um, a juice bar. And they'll go to a juice bar and, you know, you have the option, which is like the kale, spinach, uh you know, maybe a little ginger and cayenne and something else. And, and that's obviously the healthy choice. But many of us go with the green juice, but it's got a lot of apple in it. So what do you think about that when somebody's going for that? Because we obviously can taste that it's very sweet. Um, how, how do we get out of wanting that? Is it just basically not eating it and over time the desire to have that will go away? But how do we normally pick as well to those good choices? How do we stick with that? Because sometimes it's just hard. I mean, you 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 know, apples are really they're high. I mean, apples are pretty high. But also, if you're doing a lot of apple and a lot of fruits, that can also be a lot of sugar as well. But do you feel like I guess more of the fruit sugar is better than any or any other type of sugar that's uh, processed? Well, Ashley, that's really a great thought. Um, sugar. Is sugar is sugar. So <laughs> let me let me just kind of take unpack that because that was a really powerful statement that you made. First of all, when we juice, say apples straight, okay, just apples. If you just juiced apples and you just drink straight apple juice, that is like drinking almost pure sugar because you have taken out the fiber, mm. and the fiber is what keeps your insulin in check. So when you eat an apple, even if it's higher in, on the GI than, say, a blueberry, the difference is that fiber helps the whole, uh, the holistic process of digestion of the apple. And so your, glyc your, in your, uh, excuse me, your insulin does not spike up, 
okay, because you've got the fiber as a balance. When you take away the fiber and you just drink a glass of apple juice, you're, it's like drinking pure sugar. So in the old days, all of us, we would have a big glass of orange juice in the morning. And, of course, now we've come to realize that's just drinking pure sugar. It would be better to eat three oranges because not only would you get, you'd get all the fiber, you'd get the antioxidants, but something about the fact that you are eating the whole fruit. So you're at the juice bar. You're standing there. Okay. You got your little GI index. And so to be perfectly honest with you and to tell a secret on myself, I, when I started this whole process, I literally printed out the GI index of 50 and below of all the stuff I like. And I put a little copy of it in my purse and I taped it on the refrigerator door. And so it became my guide until I memorized it and I knew it cold. And so I would go to the juice bar and I would pick out the choices. And so if we had the kale and the spinach and the celery and the parsley and the beets and all that, then I might say, okay, and I'll have a little apple in there. And the apple would add just enough sweetness that it would be okay, but it's not adding a ton of sugar. But if you can find a berry, like a blueberry to put in instead, better choice. But at the same time, if you don't have the, the juice be all fruit, you're going to end up lowering that glycemic index on that on that um, on that drink a lot by putting in things like kale and spinach and beets and parsley and celery that have like very 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 low GI numbers. So you'll balance it. You'll balance out because you wouldn't have just a whole you know juice of a whole glass of apple juice. I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. You know, uh, with inflammation, brain fog is definitely. Uh, one of the symptoms of that. Another symptom is just joint pain, um, even arthritis. Is What are some of the other symptoms of somebody? So if somebody's experiencing inflammation, some of the other, maybe they might not have brain fog, but they might have these other things that categorize by inflammation. Inflammation is the enemy of our bodies. And the one thing that, Ashley, as you know, that is so important to understand is that our bodies can't deal with inflammation. We don't have a mechanism inside these miraculous healing machines that we are to deal with inflammation. It's just, it's just a flaw in the, in the construction, so to speak. So we don't, we can't do anything about it. So the only way we can, what only thing we can do is to try to keep it out of our bodies. And so, yes, joint pain is one of them. I, I knew that you interviewed um, Liza Leal about, about inflammation and joint pain. And that's one of the one sign. There can be more subtle signs. There can be things like um, heart disease and on, the, on getting way over on the spectrum, dementia and Alzheimer's. So brain fog is an indication of something out of whack as well as the joint pain. And there could be other things. Uh, fatigue is another one. High anxiety, um, depression, uh, stomach issues, gut issues, um, colon, irritable bowel syndrome, things like that. Then it can go on to other organs. It could be liver issues. Any dysfunction that we have in our bodies can be traced back to inflammation. Any dysfunction that we have in our bodies can be traced back to inflammation. That's powerful. That's powerful. When we return, we'll be talking more about how to stay healthy. You know, LJ is going to offer us some more tips and tricks on how to do that. You know, I, one of the things we want to keep in mind is that, you know, we need to do these things for the long haul. Our life is not a sprint. You know, we're not racing through it. It's about the journey. And I think that one of the biggest things is being healthy and being happy through that journey and being able to have your health. Our health is our most important thing. And now more than ever, we're starting to realize that how important it really is because when we take it for granted, well, that's where we are. And so let's work on those things. So when we return, we're giving you some more tips and tricks on how to how to handle this and how to how to get a handle on it, how to understand it, and really how to keep that information you need right there handy so you can look back at it in reference. So stay tuned. We have more solutions. You know that Live Your Tree Life is about solutions, so stay tuned. Live Your Tree Life Perspectives with your host, me, Ashley Burgess, will be back in. We'll be back this time in two shakes. This is Jake Busey, and you're listening to Perspectives with Ashley Burgess. 
Welcome back live to Live Your True Life Perspectives, and I'm your host, Ashley Burgess. On today's show, we've been talking about brain health, about brain fog, about the things you can do to overcome that, you know, about you know, taking down the, the sugar that you're eating, about being aware of the things that you're eating, processed food, what have you, but also the exercises that's necessary. But now let's switch gears a little bit because it's not just all about that. It's about doing things to make your brain healthier, to make it work more, right? And so it's not just all about the other stuff. We actually have to incorporate another piece to the puzzle. And that piece to the puzzle is what's going to really help us to live vibrantly. LJ Rowan, LJ is here in studio discussing this with us. Let me ask you, what are some things besides the diet, besides the exercise, that you get your patients to do that really helps them to live vibrantly? Thank you for asking that question, Ashley. I think two things. Number one is to incorporate music into our lives. And I ask them, I ask my clients to go way out on the limb and pick up a musical instrument. Start to learn to play a musical instrument, one that you're not familiar with. This is the most powerful thing we can do to stave off dementia and Alzheimer's. The research shows that people who play an instrument are 64% less likely to develop dementia and Alzheimer's. I took up the piano in 2011 for exactly this reason when I first read about that research. Then when I went back to school to become a gerontologist, one of my professors had written the definitive paper on this subject. It has been all over the scientific journals and in, the, and, and in National Geographic. And she said that, a, that playing an instrument is a full brain workout. Nothing like it else on the planet. Next best thing is listening to music and doing a physical activity that's non-repetitive. So that sounds really hard, but it's really not. Let's say dancing. I took up tap dancing three years ago because of that exact reason. I listen to music and I try to learn the steps. I have four left feet, but I do try. And as a result, I think my brain works better. So non-repetitive exercise by listening to music. So dancing is really, really fabulous for keeping our brain strong, our neurofiber strong, building telomeres, relieving stress, and relieving depression. And it creates new neural pathways in our brain. And the more new neural pathways we lay down, as I call the more track we lay down in our brain, the better we think, the better our cognitive function will be. And as we age, that is so critically important. Making those no, those new neural pathways is what keeps us from getting dementia and Alzheimer's. So music would be what I would suggest as one of the few things that we could absolutely gauge the difference between doing it and not doing it. And listening to music also is a really good thing. If you don't want to dance or you don't want to dance with a partner and dance by yourself in your living room with the music, that really does work. If you don't want to learn a musical instrument, I understand. So listen to music. And the important thing here is to listen to music that you don't usually listen to. So if you're a rock and roller, listen to classical. If you're a jazz, listen to Eastern music. Find other musical uh, genres to listen to because in that, in that, your brain has to understand it and it goes in your ears in a new way and it also lays down new neural pathways. Let me ask you, okay, so let's go a little in depth with the music. I, I'm a big classical music fan. I like all kinds of music. I like country. I like classical music. I listen to a lot of classical music here at the office when when there's no clients here. But when you're thinking about music, you're talking. are you talking about also music that has lyrics in it? Can that get in the way? Can that be helpful or can that hurt you? I think that if you are going to, with dancing, it doesn't really matter because you're engaging your body and you're doing a full brain workout almost when you're dancing because you're, think about this for a second, let's unpack it. You've got the audio portion, you've got the visual You've got the sense, you've got the, the sense, the physical sense of moving through space. You've got to think about what you're doing if you're doing steps. So you are engaging your brain. It doesn't matter if there's lyrics or not because you're really not going to be paying, paying attention to the lyrics. You're going to be paying attention to the music to know what to do next. You know, if you're in my tap class, I have to pay attention to the steps. I can't even tell you what they're singing. I'm paying attention to the, to the beat and following the beat. 
if you're listening to music just for the appreciation of the music, it is better to have no lyrics. To be perfectly honest, it it does. It's a different process in your brain because some people tie to the lyrics and they don't hear the sound. Mm-hmm. So it it's more it's more effective on some levels for building your neural pathways to have music that doesn't have words. That's what I was thinking, because I think you start going off on a whole other pathway of just trying to memorize the words and the lyrics, and you go off on that tangent, but you kind of forget the rest because our brain wants us to think about those words instead of really listening to the music or thinking, you know, oh, that sounds really neat, or listening to whatever, you know, key that's in or what have you. And so I think that we kind of offset the value of that. Um, let me ask you, I like the concept that, you know, it's it's the whole body mind spirit so you're taking the psychological uh component you're taking the spiritual component as well uh in this tell me more about how that spiritual component really fits in 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 your in your in your work i'm glad that you asked that because meditation is one of the most important things that we can add in And it becomes even more important, Ashley, after we turn 55 because of the difference in our brain chemistry and in the difference in our brain, what we call neuroplasticity. And that is the ability of our brain to change. And after menopause, it becomes a sort of a different landscape in many, many, many ways. And meditation calms us. It raises our cognitive function, literally. It, it raises our functioning of our brain. It also, like music, creates new neural pathways. It lowers stress. It increases the firing of our brain so that we can, re- we can retrieve data faster. It, it, it's, it's almost like it, it gives the, the neurons a supercharge. It also relieves depression, and right now, with everything going on, it bumps up our sense of peace and well-being. So I'm talking with my clients about adding meditation in, and I have a gratitude meditation app. It's free to download in both the App Store and Google Play, and it's it's about looking at what is going right in your life at this absolute moment and focusing on five things that are going right for you right now, five things you can be grateful for. And I think that is a very, very powerful and profound shift that you can create in your brain very fast and very uh, deeply, especially if you adopt it and do it every day. My husband and I do this every single night and have for about 25 years. We list the things that we have been grateful for that day. We list the things that we are thankful for that day. And I put that into a meditation several years ago and put it in the app store as my gift to the universe and to everybody out in the world because it has been so effective for me. And it's an instant shift. And there are days, Ashley, I will tell you, when I am uh, stressed, when I am worried and I need to shift my perspective instantly, I stop, I take a few deep breaths. And I do my one-minute meditation, which is also on the app. And that is stop and find five things right then that I can be grateful for. And it it will lower my stress. It will put me into a better place, and I will feel better. And this is a very key component as we get older, is finding that connection to our hearts. When we are younger, we don't have time. We are we are kids going to school, we are young professionals, we are moms and then fi- and wives and then finally and partners and then finally at 55ish we finally can focus on us. And it's time to give back to us something that that helps our hearts. And so we're able to really nurture our hearts at this point in our life. And meditation is a wonderful way to nurture our, our, inner, our inner life and our inner being and, and, and reap all those benefits that I just mentioned from doing just a quiet time. And there's all kinds of meditation that you, you can do. I find this one to be effective because you can do it anywhere. There's also sitting quietly and saying a mantra. There is a walking meditation. There's all kinds. Whatever works for you. But throw in there while you're walking or you're doing your mantra, five things you're grateful for. Or do it as a separate one. 
it will really, truly, after 30 days, it will change your life. Oh, that's powerful stuff. And I, I agree with you with the meditation. And, and I feel like a lot of times we get in our own way. You know, we get in our own way, the stress and anxiety that we're dealing with. We're future thinking. We're going down that path. We're creating all kinds of craziness and havoc all the way down that path of things that aren't going to happen. But we let it take over our entire brain share. And then there we are worried about what's going to happen in the future. And you're right. When it comes to meditation and being able to just quiet the mind a little bit, uh, you know, the monkey mind of just all these thoughts, what happened yesterday, what happened about the day, what happened in the meeting, the crises, the problems, what's going to happen in the future, all of that stuff just takes a back seat when you're doing this properly. Um, and, and I think it's awesome that you created um, – you created a meditation and a gratitude meditation. I think that's awesome. So do you use that within your practice as well with your clients and, and put that in a daily uh, regiment for them? Absolutely. I do. I, I offer it to them to be part, become part of their life because I have seen how powerful meditation is and I've seen the shift that happens. And, and I just want to speak for one moment, if I may, about the shift that happens and the power of being grateful. There is probably nothing on the planet that can change our physiology as much as taking on an attitude of gratitude. There is extensive science. The HeartMath Institute in California from all, to the scientists at Harvard have all proven that being grateful changes our physiology. It changes our chemistry. It changes our brain chemistry. It it lowers our blood pressure. It heals our our physical heart, not not counting our emotional heart. It does so many things physiologically and emotionally for us. It is one of, and actually, I take that back. It is probably the most powerful choice that we can make in our lives that will change our lives for the greatest good, and that is to become grateful for every single thing, the bad and the good, the bad and the good, because in the bad, somewhere in there, there is a lesson to help us grow. As you know, as a life coach, you know this so well, and therefore being grateful in that dark moment for the lesson that I don't know yet the answer to, the lesson I, has not been revealed to me yet, but will be. So I'm going to be grateful for it ahead of time. I'm just going to put some gratitude in the bank, and it will change your life. Grati being grateful is such a profound shift in the way you see the world, the way you interact with people, the way people see you. You will become a different person. The energy you emanate will be different, and people will be even more attracted to you than they already were because you are emanating from a place of being grateful for everything that happens in your life. And there's, I don't believe there's anything more powerful. And a great German philosopher said this, Master, Master Eckhart said, if you only say one prayer, say thank you. And it will be enough. Powerful stuff. LJ, I'm so glad to have you on the show. I can't wait to have you back. I mean, a wealth of knowledge, very informative and, and very powerful. You know, I think that when we when we live with this protocol and we begin to add this into our daily life, I think you're right. Not only will we be healthy, but we will be living vibrantly. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you, Ashley, so much for having me. I have so enjoyed this conversation immensely. Well, I look forward to having you back on soon. Thank you. I look forward to being back. Great show. When I return, I'll be talking more about what we need to do. I'm going to sum it up for you, put a bow on it, as well as giving some more information, some tips and tricks on, on how to live more vibrantly. Uh, we owe it to ourselves to live well. We owe it to ourselves to be healthy and happy because that's how we're supposed to be living, right? So we need to really think, figure out how to make that happen and make that a true reality. Stay tuned. Live your true life perspectives with your host, me, Ashley Burgess. We'll be back in. I'll be back this time. Two shakes. You're listening to Perspectives with Ashley Burgess.
Welcome back live to Live Your True Life Perspectives, and I'm your host, Ashley Burgess. What a great show. Uh, LJ is, a, is an amazing guest. She's great. And what she says really hits home, right? I mean, it's some of the things that we really need to do. I mean, this is important stuff. I mean, we really need to do it. And, and I know that we can't all be perfect right now. I know that having that glass of wine at night might help you all. I get that. Maybe having a little bit of candy here and there. I understand. But basically, it's about limiting as much of that stuff as possible. Okay? And that's one of the best things we can do is just limit it. We can begin to limit it. And I think over time, the more and more healthy you feel, the better you feel, the more you want to go all the way. And I think that, you know, LJ had a lot to offer when it comes to how, how we need to eat. The things that we don't need to eat. The things that we can do for our brain health. Whether it's, you know, learning how to play an instrument. And my husband's playing the violin, actually, right now. He's doing a great job. He's very talented. I, I can't even really think about reading sheet music at this point in time. And I, I don't know if you're with me or or you're in his camp, but I haven't really thought about it. I do want to learn an instrument, but, you know, to be honest with you, I don't know if I could be consistent with it. And it's something that maybe I just need to, you know, just do it. I think I'd probably have to hire somebody, though, to teach me, to give me lessons on whatever it is that I'm learning um, I'll have to figure that out. But in the meantime, I'm going to listen to music. Uh, I love listening to classical music. It really does help your brain. There's studies about how classical music does help your brain, and it's something that you want to listen to. Uh, I've realized a long time ago, and I like all kinds of music. I like rap. I like country. I like everything. But I've realized that really classical music does do a wealth of good for my brain and also just the way I feel. And I loved what she was talking about when it came to the meditation being grateful, and, you know, thinking about that, are you grateful? How grateful are you? Have you thought about what you're grateful for? We have a tendency to look at what's going wrong in our life, and when we look at what's going wrong in our life, it doesn't seem like anything can go right. I feel like more and more than ever, because of so much media and press and information that's so negative and constricting and controlling, we begin to get more and more fear-based, we get more and more anxiety, we get more and more stress, anxiety, we feel overwhelmed. And what happens when we feel overwhelmed? Well, we take it out on ourselves. we don't exercise, we eat poorly, we snack a lot, we drink to excess, we might even do drugs, take pharmaceuticals to calm down, we might even take other types of drugs as well to try to escape. And... You know, the thing about escape is everybody's tried it, but you don't escape from anything. You wake up the next day back in the back in the middle of it all. No escape. And your head's pounding and you're feeling even worse than you did before. And I understand when people say, well, I have all this on me. I have all this weighing on me. Well, we need to begin to unpack all that's weighing on you. And you begin you need to begin to see that and to realize that we have this one life right now. And it's interesting how people don't realize that the most valuable relationship they have is with themselves. It just is. But most people never develop that relationship because they never see the value. They work on all other relationships. Even they get on dating sites and they learn more about somebody that they don't even ever meet personally. They learn more about them than they learn about themselves. And I find it tragic. And I find it sad. And I find it that we're literally running through life hoping that other people will love us and that we can save them or take care of them or whatever. And they'll love us for it. And then we'll get our value from that. Our value is not derived from how someone else feels about us. Our value is derived about how we feel about ourselves. And, you know, when we take care of ourselves and we do the right thing for ourselves, we show ourselves even more that we care about ourselves. And that's really valuable. That's timely. That's valuable. And more than now than ever, every single day, we need to look at ourselves and find the things that we're grateful for. We need to begin to unpack some of that old resentment and pain and anger and realize when old resentment, pain, and anger are taking us out of living our life, putting us on the sidelines of life. And it's interesting 
when we experience pain at a young age, we don't realize how that turns and spins into our adult life and our older adult life and how we live by that pain. And it's sad that we had to experience that pain. It's not right. It was wrong when somebody put pain on us, made us feel bad, took advantage of us. But that situation should not plague our entire life. We should be able to overcome that. But we need the tools to do it. We need to be able to excavate the stuff in our mind, be able to take that stuff out, stop trying to compartmentalize things. Okay? And, and it's important because we have this time and there's no time like the present. It's about using our time wisely, getting through what we need to get through, unpacking the drama, unpacking the anger. All, all of that needs to go away because any anger, resentment, fear that you're holding on to is only holding you back. And so I really appreciated the interview today with LJ. And I think she offers us so much information Think about that. What can you do today to better your life? What can you do today to make one small incremental change that's going to change your life forever? And I, I want you to think about one thing is that a lot of times people don't want to work on themselves. They see everything else as important. Uh, well, we need a new car, a new pair of shoes, going out to dinner, you know, buying this for the house, getting a new big screen TV, whatever it looks like. But we never really look at the value of taking care of ourselves and learning about ourselves. That's what Live Your True Life Perspectives is all about, is about learning about yourself and taking that into consideration and not taking it for granted. Why take it for granted? I mean, when we take our life for granted, we take our life for granted. Why? It's like we're giving somebody else the power to live our life. It's up to us to be happy. It's up to us to be successful in our own life. And it's not just about money. People get confused. They think that success is based on money or power or title. It's based on you unconditionally loving you. But you can't unconditional love you until you unpack all the crap that gets in the way of you seeing your value. And that is what is so important. I appreciate LJ for being on the show. She'll definitely be back on. And I want you to just take a moment to think about what you can do to make some changes in your life. When you get a chance, check out the new website, the10daychallenge.com. The word the, the number 10challenge.com, the10challenge.com. It's, it's a great new site that we just created, and it's um, it goes through my new master class, the 10-day master class, where I've actually taken the 10-day challenge to the next level and I've actually designed 10 masterclass sessions, all video, that take you to that next level. It's ten. It's like taking 10 master's coaching classes with me, being in session, one-on-one. -on -one. It's right there. So check out the 10-day challenge, the 10daychallenge.com. Also, don't forget to check out the website, ashleyburgess.com. Go to Ashley, B-E-R-G-E-S.com, Ashley, B-E-R-G-E-S.com. And you can watch anything there. You can watch some of the shows. You can watch some of the stuff in studio. You can connect with the podcast. You can connect with Spreaker, iHeart. And also you can connect with YouTube. So you can go right onto YouTube and connect right there. We got the latest videos out, new videos out every single week to help to educate, inform, and everything in the middle as well as entertain. So check it out. Again, appreciating our guest today. And have a wonderful day. Please share this with your family and friends because they can use this information because it can change their life for the better. Anything that can make people's lives better, that's awesome. We want to help everybody. We want to unite and strengthen everyone. And together, we can do just that. Have a wonderful day and live your true life perspectives with your host, me, Ashley Burgess, will be back in. You know I'll be back this time in three shakes. Three shakes.